1 Peter 2, 4 through 5 reads, Coming to him as to a living stone rejected indeed by men, but chosen by God and precious. You also, as living stones, are being built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. If you want to turn in your Bibles to 1 Peter, we'll spend uh, part of our time there. Uh, I don't usually use a podium because they're too close to my face. And I can't read my Bible, so and now I've got Cheeto dust on my glasses, and that's going to be a problem. I knew better eat those Cheetos. I should have ate a regular chip. <laughs> What's a temple? Anybody ever been to a temple? What? Anybody know what a temple is? Not this. That's a piece on your head. Uh, in every religion, in every culture. In every place where there's ever been temples built, a temple is an intersection between the divine and the human. That's why they had temples. Now, in, in the Greek world, the temples were places that they went and honored their gods. There was a temple built to Zeus that had a, an iron chariot, and the priest had rigged magnets under it, and when you went in and gave a certain amount of sacrifice, they changed those magnets and that metal chariot would float. Can you imagine living in a world that doesn't have computer graphics and CG stuff? I mean, we see stuff like that, we think, ah, it's fake. I don't believe anything I see on, on a video anymore. As, as soon as they faked Luke Skywalker in the Mandalorian series, and he wasn't even in the movie, I was like, oh, wow. So if you show me the video of Bigfoot, I'm not going to believe it because they can fake everything now. But in that world, they walked into Zeus's temple and that metal chariot and that horse levitated. That was huge. Now, ancient religions work like Facebook, in case you didn't know that. The more FaceTime you give Facebook the more they cycle you into things that you like or you're interested in, and they're reading how much time your face spends. You, you're selling them your, 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 your eye contact. And there's, there's a big push that they weren't watching anything over seven seconds. And for a long time, Facebook was monetizing, allowing you to make one-minute reels, and if you could get people to engage with your reel for more than seven seconds, they would monetize it a little bit. I've got a buddy who teaches uh, jiu-jitsu, and he does a lot of stuff on the internet. He bought a Tesla with one month's worth of Facebook money. He had 84 million hits on some of his stuff. But all they're doing is you look at something, and when you look at something, they go, he's looking at that, and they send you more stuff that you'll look at. And so it's a reinforcing loop. So the ancient gods, if you brought grain to Zeus, Zeus is more powerful, and Zeus would make your crops grow, so you'd make more grain, and Zeus would give you more. And it was this reinforcing loop. That's why when Paul talks to the pagans there on Mars Hill, he says, our God is him in whom we live and move and have our being. We don't, God doesn't need anything from us. We need everything from him. Worshiping the creator God was not about a reinforcing loop. There's no real upside in God loving us. God loves us. In fact, if you look at one of the best definitions I ever heard for love, it's love is the intentional and if necessary, personally costly investment into the good of another. It does not consider return of investment or reciprocity and it does not predicate on the fact the other person deserves to be loved I mean that's the gospel we don't deserve to be loved and God loves us we can't do anything for God God does everything for us and then God gave us a chance to be redeemed at a investment that was personally costly to him that's, that's huge so God loves us and wants us to be elevated to a place where we can live with him. That's why ownership is so important. And so when we, we, we go from submission to, to, to ownership, 
in our discussion. And so as you read this, and, and one of the things about 1 Peter is if you sum 1 Peter up, it's about suffering. The underlying theme of 1 Peter is suffering, 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 and that suffering shouldn't be a big deal. You're going to suffer, and, and there's ways to get past it, and the end result of suffering is always glorification. And it's, it's a theme in the Bible. Romans 5, uh, perseverance leads to character, and character produces hope. And hope is demonstrated because God poured out his love for us. James chapter 1, when you have various trials, rejoice in them because you'll be made better. Uh, Paul says in 1 Corinthians, hey, my weakness is how God demonstrates his strength. So he's talking about suffering a lot, but in, in discussing this thing about suffering, he gives us an insight into how God sees us and something about ownership. So 1 Peter chapter 2. Now he's challenging his audience to be holy because you shouldn't quit your holiness you, you shouldn't quit living for God because it's difficult. And so he challenges them to be holy and set your minds on these things, be fully sober, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 13. But we get into what we call in the English Bible chapter 2. Because of this call to holiness, he says, Therefore, rid yourselves of all malice and deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander of every kind. It's interesting that a lot of what Peter talks about is not actually, not actually like super moral stuff as much as he's talking about, listen how you need to treat people. When, you know, Paul will spend a lot of time talking to the Corinthians about sexual sin. But Peter says, look, you can't have malice. That's me being mad at you, me not liking you, me holding a grudge against you. You can't have malice. You can't have deceit i got to be honest with you. I'm not going to lie to you. I'm not going to lie about you. I, if I have a contract with you, I'm going to fulfill it. If I tell you I'll be there, I'll be there. If I tell you I'm going to do it, I'll do it. Hypocrisy. I can't fake like I'm your friend and then treat you bad. Uh, I can't be envious. I, if, if you win and I don't, or if you have a new bike and I don't, or if you get some, I, I'm not going to treat you that way. I'm not going to be envious. And then slander. I'm not going to talk bad about you. I'm not going to spread rumors. And, and by the way, girls, the only way rumors spread is if you listen to them, period. I do a lot of stuff on bullying for schools, and, and one of the things I say is my friends don't dump trash on me. So if, you know, if, if, if uh, Tripp comes up and says, hey, you know what Carter said about you? Well, Tripp gets to tell me what Carter said and not have to be responsible for it because he's just repeating it. And that's pretty much a coward. If I got something to say to you, I'm going to say it to you. I'm not going to say it third party. So my friends don't dump trash on me. So if somebody says something to one of my friends, says, hey, Lonnie, we, first of all, my friends will go, that's not Lonnie. And they never repeat it to me. And so we don't do slander. We don't put it on Twitter. We don't put it on Facebook. We don't put it on Instagram. We don't repeat it to anybody else. And a rumor and a lie only grows because you water it and just quit repeating that stuff. I don't need to know that somebody out there doesn't like me. They'll let me know eventually. <laughs> okay? And, and, so he's, when, and so when he says you get rid of all this, most of what he's telling his audience to get rid of is not the stuff like sexual sin. It's just how you treat people normally. And so Peter says get rid of all this stuff. And as you get rid of all this stuff, instead of having that bad stuff in your life, verse 2, like newborn babies crave the pure spiritual milk that you may grow up in your salvation if you've tasted that the Lord is good. I don't know how many of you have little brothers and sisters or little cousins that are still being fed with a bottle. Have you ever noticed how obsessed babies are with bottles? We, we raised a bunch of puppies. Uh, and so I hadn't had a baby in my house in a long time, uh, not in the one that was drinking milk. And, and the puppies craved milk. And it was just like you could get a, you could pour milk in them and they would run over you to get to the milk. And he says, when you start thinking about, okay, I'm not going to talk about people. I'm not going to be envious. I'm not going to slander. I'm not going to lie. I'm not going to be a hypocrite. But if I'm not going to be looking at all that stuff, what you, well, you need to be obsessed. You need to crave the sincere milk of the word so you can grow. Now, the milk of the word in lots of passages means the fundamental elemental teachings. Now, 
there's a place where you've got to outgrow that. But you can't outgrow it till you master it. In everything you do from baseball to shooting to drawing to playing a musical instrument until you master the basics, you can't grow. So if you don't know enough about Christianity to explain one of your friends about salvation and about prayer and about repentance and about honesty, you can't grow as a Christian because you don't know the fundamentals. You don't know the basics. And so he says, you, you crave, you get obsessed with how can I master the fundamentals of the milk of the word so that you can grow thereby. And then he kind of does this play on words. If you've tasted that the word of God is good. Now, I want you to drink milk if you've tasted that it's good. Well, yeah, milk is good. And then once you taste it, what do you want when you taste something that's good? You want more. All right? So he says, so now you're doing this. You're getting rid of these things that interfere with your relationship with people. And then you're building up these things that, that, that build your relationship with God, the fundamentals, the sincere milk of the word. And then verse 4, as you come to him, the living stone rejected by humans, but chosen by God and precious to him. So he's telling us that Jesus is, is like this living stone. And he's going to talk about Jesus being the living stone. And he talks that he's the cornerstone of the temple. Now it's interesting that when you start talking about the New Testament church, our temple is not a building. Our temple is, is made up of living stones. And the chief living stone, the stone that you put at the, the corner and, and you get your plum and your level for where all the other stones are stacked, that one cornerstone, you may go downtown and you see the edge of a, a bank building or the edge of the courthouse and it'll have a stone, it'll be engraved. And there's one passage that says there's an engraving on the cornerstone of the church that says the Lord knows who are his. That's pretty cool. Not established, but the Lord knows who are his. Well, you've got this, this living stone. Now, you'll find out that Jesus is going to be referred to as the stone the builders rejected. So you've got these guys that are going to build this holy temple, and they've got this stone, they go, ah, we're not, we're not going to use that. Well, he's referring to the Jewish nation that they rejected Jesus as the Messiah. And, and they, were going to leave, they, they weren't going to use Christianity, and they're going to stay in their temple. Well, their temple was destroyed in 70 A.D. It wasn't going to last, and he told them it wasn't going to last. But the interesting thing is, in order to build the temple, the original temple that Solomon built, about the footprint of a basketball court, about 90 feet long, about 45 feet wide, maybe three stories overlaid in hammered gold and inlaid with ivory. And then after that temple was destroyed, they rebuilt Ezra's temple. And then after Ezra's temple, they added to it and Herod added on a complex to this temple. In all of those cases, most scholars think that the, the stones that they built that temple out of were quarried, dug out of the ground at a site 650 yards outside the city of Jerusalem. Uh, you guys ever seen a rock quarry? What does it look like? It looks like bare rock. From way off in a distance, you see that arc of rock, and it looks like a skull. Jesus was crucified in a place called the skull. The place of the skull. Most people who look at that pretty seriously believe that he was crucified in the old rock quarry. The stone the builders rejected was crucified in the rock quarry. That's not accidental. That's not coincidental. When Jesus is standing to be condemned to die, the temple sits on Mount Moriah and on the north east corner of the temple is the Roman fortress Antonio. You leave the temple gate you go down a flight of steps, up a flight of steps and there was this Roman fortress and he's standing there in the pavement when Pilate condemns him to die. He's within three football fields of where Abraham would have sacrificed Isaac had he gone through with it. God chose that spot and said you do this thing and then when God gives his only son. That's what he tells Abraham. You take your son, your one and only son, 
And that's what John described. God so loved the world that he gave his son, his one and only son. He's condemned to die. With You could see where Abraham would have sacrificed Isaac and they crucify him in the rock quarry. The living stone. Now, you come to this living stone that was rejected by humans but chosen by God and precious to him. God chose this stone. He chose Jesus to be this living stone, to be this cornerstone. And, and, and that stone was rejected by men but chosen by God. And not only was it chosen by God, it was precious to God. Now, as kids, you may not get the word precious. You may have some toys that you think are precious. I'm talking about the way your parents look at you. How precious. Uh, my daughter was dating a young man, and we liked him. Really good guy, a guy named Tyler. They ended up getting married. But before they got married, Tyler's dad sat down with his son and said, Hey, we love LB. That's my, my daughter's name is Lonnie Elizabeth. We call her Lonnie Beth. And everybody that played volleyball with her called her LB. So this young man who's in love with her calls her LB. His grandmother, this old southern belle from Georgia. That girl's name's Elizabeth, and you call her LB. You should be whipped. Anyway, so he calls her LB. Well, his dad sits down with him and says, Tyler, we love LB, and we think you love LB. But until you treat her like you cherish her, you don't marry her. Now, that's his dad. That's not the talk I had with him. <laughs> that's, that's his dad. He said, you can't marry this girl unless she's precious to you. Well, God picked Jesus and said, this is precious to me. And that's that living stone. So you come to him as the living stone rejected by men, but chosen and precious by God. And you, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house. A holy priesthood offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. A temple in any religion at any time in history, any place in the world, was an intersection between the divine and the human. And God said, your purpose is I want you to be my temple. And a temple is the intersection of the divine and the human. You live in God, and God lives in you. And in the same way that Jesus was the living stone, he's asking you as part of my temple, as part of my dwelling, as part of this intersection between the divine and the human, I want to have this relationship with you so you can be a living stone. I want to dwell in you. So now we're not just talking about ownership, but now we're talking about residency. God lives in us, and we live in God. Are there things that aren't allowed in your house? Mice, rats, and spiders. That's the Jones household. Mice, rats, and spiders. And I don't mind, it doesn't matter what size. Doesn't matter how long, doesn't matter dead or alive. No mice, rats, or spiders. And they get dealt with with swift, severe punishment. And, and it's these things don't come in my house. Well, God has, has this house, and he says, there's some things that aren't allowed here. Now, do you have the right to say what's allowed in your house or not? Why? your house <laughs> and, and that's the whole point God says if you're going to live in my house with me and if I'm going to live in you as part of my house I get to say what's allowed here who is the Lord that we should obey him well he's not only the builder and maker he not only has this proprietary ownership of us he, he lives in us and, and there's some things that, that if God's going to live in your house you, you can't have in your house there's some things you don't allow in your house, and there's some things God doesn't allow in his house. In fact, in the, the commandment that says, you shall have no other gods before me. I think sometimes we, we read that and we think that if we've got a list, as long as God is number one, we can have the list. That's not what that commandment means. He says, when you come into my presence, don't bring anything else. 
not I'm number one and music is number two and art is number three. It's when you come into my presence, you bring no other God before me. I, I can't bring another girl home. That's one of the other things not allowed in my house. Mites, rats, spiders, and other girls. <laughs> okay, because Jackie said, you can't, I can't be your best girl. I'm your only girl, which is cool. That's the way it's designed. One man, one woman for one lifetime. And God says, I'm going to have this relationship with you. I'm going to live in you. You're going to live in me. And we're going to be exclusive because I don't allow other gods in my house. Now, you may not think that you're worshiping Baal or Dagon or Ashtaroth or Thor or Zeus. But you can worship popularity and you can worship pleasure and you can worship money and you can worship stuff just as much as you can worship some pagan deity that doesn't exist. Because those things do exist, and they compete with you as to who lives in your life and to whose house you live in. So it says, you come to him as a living stone being built into a spiritual house. You're, you're part of a building that becomes this spiritual house. And in this spiritual house, you, a spiritual house is a temple who works in temples. Priest. So you live in this spiritual house, and because you live in the spiritual house, you are now a holy priesthood. And what you do as a holy priesthood is you offer sacrifices that are acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Now, sacrifice is something that you give to God. It's something that you give up for God. It's something that you do, and you do it in a way that is acceptable to God. Well, if you're the priest and you're worshiping in his temple, he has the right to say what is allowed and what is not allowed. And this is not just talking about worship. This is talking about lifestyle, that your lifestyle is an acceptable, holy praise to God. That your job, when you go to school, when you play sports, when you go to work, when you have your own home, everything you do is something that says, hey, I belong to God's temple, I'm one of God's people, I live in God and God lives in me, and it honors and glorifies and praises God. And that's the mission, that's why our ownership and our residency is super, super important. And then he quotes, see, I lay a stone in Zion chosen and precious cornerstone, the one who trusts in him will never be ashamed. Now, you who believe, this stone is precious. But to those who do not believe, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone, a stone that causes people to stumble and a rocks that make people fall. He says, when, when you decide that you're going to, to let God live in you and there's residency and because this is where God lives and you become a part of God's house, he says, there are things I allow in my house, there's things that I don't allow in my house, there's things you have to do in my house and because you're a, living in a spiritual house, that makes you a spiritual resident, that makes you a priest and priests offer sacrifices. He's now, when you, when you figure this out, and Jesus becomes precious to you because you're precious to him. You live in a way that is fulfilling. And then people who have rejected Jesus, people who don't value Jesus, those who don't believe, this, this cornerstone becomes a rock that makes people trip. It gives people a hard time. Now, I'm, I'm just going to be honest that one of the reasons people fall out of the church because they really don't they really they really don't love Jesus they just don't want to go to hell and so their relationship with Jesus is he's not precious he's just a way to escape something bad and so then you've got this relationship with Jesus and because of that this is a stone that'll that'll trip you up because you can't live very long with what we call cognitive dissonance that's this you can live like this, you can live like this, but you can't live like this. And so when, when you don't view Jesus as precious and you don't view him as Lord and you don't love him and you're just obeying the rules rather than following the, the values, the idea that, that God is precious to you and you're precious to him and you have this relationship where you live in him and he lives in you, that's why people stumble and fall because this whole Christianity thing gives people a hard time. It's difficult. 
He says, oh, I want you to come to him and you're, you're, you're a living stone and you're joining, you're being connected to the original living stone and you're being built into this living temple. God in you, you and God, the intersection between the divine and the intersection w- with the human. And then you this cornerstone connects you to each other and connects you to him and then you you offer these spiritual sacrifices. And if you don't, if you reject this stone, if you play this with him, then it's going to be a thing that makes you stumble. Keep reading uh, verse, the last part of verse 8. They stumble because they disobey the message. And that's what they were destined for. See, God gives you some, some obedience to follow. God gives you some things of how you treat one another, how you treat your parents, of how you interact with Him, of how you worship Him, when you attend worship. All those things, and, and the people who stumble, they say they love God, but they disobey the message. And when you disobey what God teaches you, when you disobey what God tells you, what happens? You stumble and you're destroyed. And that's, that's what you're destined for. Destined doesn't mean God made you do it, but God says, if this, then this. Um, one of my really, really close friends has an R1 sport bike. He showed up at my house on this, this rocket. I said, why don't you just paint a sight on it, because all you're doing is aiming yourself at stuff. He showed me a picture from his GoPro helmet. The speedometer doing 175 miles an hour on this bike. I got my old Bible out, turned to the back and said, the fiery crash that killed our friend. I said, that's the opening line of your funeral, okay? <laughs> we call him level one. That's level one trauma. Because <laughs> when he wrecks that, and he will, because it just, I mean, you hit a paper cup at 175 miles an hour, you're, you're gone. You're, des- this is your, you're destined for this. Well, God said, when you disobey me and you reject the living stone and you don't participate in the living temple, you're going to stumble. And when you stumble, that, that's kind of an idiom or an idea that you failed. You've fallen. And that's what you're destined for when you don't live in God and God doesn't live in you. They're destined for this, verse 9, but you are a chosen people. Now, what does it mean to be chosen? Do they still do the thing in grade school where they pick teams to play kickball? You ever been the kid not chosen? You know, Bradley shakes his head, never been the kid not chosen. I've been the kid not chosen. Let's play basketball. You, 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 you. The kid from the Special Olympics. The short white kid. No, that's me, you know. I'm good in basketball for five, for five fouls. That should be my number. Because if that's all I got, bring that trash in the lane, I'll hurt you. And then they'll sit me down, you know. On the last great day, if you have any fouls left, you are wrong. I've been the guy not chosen, trust me. Have you ever been the guy that they chose? Hey, we want you to be on our team. Hey, I'm coach so-and-so. I'm putting together a travel team. Would you play ball for me? Hey, I'm so-and-so, and and I'm, I'm doing this musical, and I want you to be one of my singers. Hey, we've got some... You ever been the person chosen? But you talking about us, or a chosen people. God picked us to be on his team. You're a chosen people, a royal priesthood. You live in a temple, not not the kind of temple that everybody else is. This is a living temple, so so you're a royal priesthood, a holy nation. We, We not just have living in God, but we live like as God's people, and so we get this identity and, and I like being an American. I'm proud to be an American. And when I go, when I went overseas and did some stuff, I wore a, a, a bandana that was red, white, and blue like the American flag. They knew I was an American. But it's more important that I'm a citizen of God's kingdom. I'm a Christian. You're his own holy nation, God's special possession. Now, I've got some things that are special in my life. I've got some things that are reserved. I've got stuff that I only use for certain occasions. I don't use them for anything else. And and they're designed for a purpose, and because they're designed for the purpose, they don't get used for other stuff. I've got some special ropes that I climb with. I don't use those, those ropes to pull trucks. I don't use those ropes to pull limbs out of trees. I don't use those ropes to tow boats. I don't use those ropes to I use it for one thing, one thing only. 
Now, will they tow a truck? Yeah. Will they pull a boat? Yeah. Can you sink them in water and leave them and keep a, a trap? Yeah. You, you don't, but they're designed for a special purpose, a climbing rope, a safety rope. They'll catch you if you fall. And I don't use them for anything else. So God's given you a special purpose, a special design. He's picked you and said, I'm reserving you for a special purpose. That's what the word sanctified means. That's what the word holy means. It means set aside for a special purpose. And God, Now, if God says you have this special purpose, does God have the right or the authority to say, here's some things you can't do with it, here's some things you can do with it? That's what ownership's about. You're a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own special possession that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. At one time you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you have not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Why should I obey God? Not because of what God can do to me, but because of what God has done for me. You used to live in darkness. And God wants you to be one of his priests and live in his temple and offer these sacrifices and declare his praises. Why? Because he brought you out of darkness into his marvelous light. At one time you and God couldn't be friends because of sin, but God fixed that relationship. You weren't not a people, but now you're a people. We've got a good friend who moved to this country and, and became a naturalized citizen. He, he was not an American. And he came to this country and earned his American citizenship and he went to medical school and he's a trauma surgeon and, and he's a, a very patriotic American because he wasn't an American at one time and now he is. Well, at one point we weren't Christians and now we are. At one point we weren't able to say we're in God's nation and in fellowship with God, but now we are. So he says, I've called you out of darkness so that you can declare these things. At one point you didn't have mercy, but now you have mercy. Dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and as exiles to abstain from the sinful indulgences which wage against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans, though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may by your good deeds glorify God on the day that he visits us. He says, when I've asked you to be part of my kingdom, when I've asked you to be part of my priesthood, when I've asked you to be part of my citizenship, when I've asked you to be these things, I want you to live such a life that if somebody accuses you of something wrong, it'll make them feel foolish. I want you to live such good lives among people who aren't my people that when they see you, they praise me because of how honest you are, because of how good you are, because of how nice you are, because of how respectful you are, because of how helpful you are, because of what kind of a, a, a citizen you are, what kind of a servant you are. And all of a sudden, this picture of that God is telling me what to do, and sometimes I don't like it, it, it boils down to, well, God made me, he designed me, he created me, so he has the right to tell me what to do with my life. And then when I get to participate in the temple of God, and I live in God, and God lives in me, and I become part of a priesthood, I become part of a nation, I become part of a special people, I'm a living stone. God says, I, I'm asking you to do these things so it'll honor me and bring you into a place where people respect you because of your connection to me. That's, wow, how powerful that is. Now, how did we become God's special possession? Have you ever thought about that? How did, how did you know, you're, you're a living stone, you're a royal priesthood, you, you live in this holy nation, how did you go from not being a people to being a people? How did you go from not having mercy to having mercy? What did you do to get that? What, what did you do to get that? Go, go, go back to 1 Peter chapter 1. In 1 Peter chapter 1, it says, I want you to know that you were redeemed not with perishable things. Look at verse 17. Since you call him his father who judges each person impartially, live your time out as foreigners here in reverent. You know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down from your ancestors, but with the precious blood of Christ. 
a lamb without blemish or defect. He was chosen before the creation of the world, but was revealed in these times for your sake. And then he goes into what we read. See, when God says you're a, a, a nation and you're a living stone and you're a royal priesthood and I, I've got this job for you to do, the, the reason God can say this is how I want you to live and this is what I want you to be, not only did God build you, not only does God dwell in you, not only do we dwell in God, but God bought us. And it's not just that he bought us, this word is redeemed. And the word redeemed is, is, is almost the idea of being rescued from a bad situation. And how did God rescue us from a bad situation? You like to watch movies about hostage rescue? The, the, the elite guys in hostage rescue, or there's a group of guys that work for the FBI, they're called the HRT, hostage rescue team. Most of them are former Delta operators. Most of them were on Delta Force or Navy SEALs. And they're the best of the best of the best of the best. And all they do is fly around the world and do anti-terror hostage rescue stuff. We got to take a class from a guy that was a hostage rescue guy, a guy named Phil Singleton, a little British dude. He's about 135 pounds. He can take an MP5 and he has it strapped to his chest and he's given a lecture about how to use the MP5 submachine gun and they slide a target out on a, on a wire and go, Phil, left eye. He goes, Burr! turns back around. He'll put three holes in the left eye of the target that touch each other on full automatic. He, he made the team take a MP5 on full automatic and learn to touch the trigger and just get one shot out. And that, that weapon shoots 800 rounds a minute. That's 10 bullets a second. And when you mash it, it goes, but he can go, Pop, and just one, or he can do a three round burst. And when they rescue hostages, he was on the plane that they had uh, on the tarmac, and they dressed up like waiters, and they went into the cargo, and they had their silenced pistols under napkins. And they were walking down the aisle like they were giving people refreshments. And as they walked by the bad guys, and they rescued those guys. Now, sometimes you go into a building to rescue somebody, and the good guys get shot. A lot of times when you have to get a downed officer out, you, you have to go into a perimeter, and you've got a hurt officer, you go in to rescue that guy. When God rescued you, he only sent one person. And he knew Jesus wasn't going to survive it. He bought you, not with gold, not with silver, not with bullets. He bought you with the blood of his son. Now, if that's what I paid for you, is there anything I can't ask you to do? Hey, since I bought you, since I rescued you as a hostage of sin, and I didn't use gold, and I didn't use silver, and I didn't use force, I used love, and my son died so that you could live, this is how I'd like you to treat your parents. This is how I'd like you to treat this guy that's mean to you at school. This is how I want you to handle things when you've got a temptation to lie. I, 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 I don't even have sex with people until you're married. And all of a sudden, looking at the things that God asks us to do and the things God asks us not to do, it's not this, who is God that I should obey him? Well, if this is what God did for me, is there anything that I would refuse to do for God? So not only are we designed, not only are we built, but because of the, what God built us to do to participate in a building, not a building of brick and mortar and stone, but of a living spiritual building. And the reason we become precious stones to God is because God paid for us the highest price you could pay. And you'll notice what he talked about before the creation of the world. God said, I'm going to build these people and they're not going to be perfect. And instead of doing what we do with our artwork when it's not perfect, I'm going to throw it away. Hey, I'm going to build these imperfect people, but I'm going to find a way to fix it. I'm going to find a way when they don't live up to, well, when they live up to their potential of being imperfect and, and, and they, they run off the rails and their wheels are in the ditch, 
I've got something I can send that will rescue them from being stuck. And not only will I rescue them, I'm going to put them in place and connect them to my son. And I'm going to build this living building of holy priest so that when people look at their lives, they'll declare my praises because they belong to me. That's pretty powerful. That's what it means to be owned. Because God not only designed us, but He paid for us and He dwells in us. In the last lesson of the day, we'll talk about what that looks like. How you and I should behave because of the ownership, because of the design, and because of what was paid for us. Uh, let's pray together. Father, we thank you for letting us participate in your light. We thank you for allowing us to be part of the living temple. We thank you for living in us. Father, help us to look at these scriptures seriously and to affect our thinking so that we become faithful priests and that our lives are a living sacrifice to you. Father, help us to recognize that because we are precious to you, you should be precious to us. And Father, help us to live like people who don't own ourselves but someone who recognizes that we are owned and because of that ownership we are submissive because of the fact that you live in us and we live in you. Father, bless us in the rest of our activities, bless our songs, bless our free time. We thank you for the, the good things you've done for us this weekend. In Jesus' name, amen.